All right, everyone, this lecture is going to go quickly through uh, the different types of agriculture, world regions of agriculture. Remember, the world is divided up into agricultural regions based on whether or not a person is choosing to farm for subsistence agriculture, which is for their own survival, or for commercial agriculture, which is for strictly economic gain. Of course, those are going to coincide with MDCs and LDCs, MDCs most likely participating in commercial agriculture, whereas LDCs participating in subsistence. Uh, when we talk about agricultural cup hearth and the agricultural revolution, remember that there are three agricultural revolutions, the first being the Neolithic era around 8000 BC, the second being the second agricultural revolution, which is going to coincide with the Industrial Revolution around 1750. And then the third one is one that we have not yet spoken about, and that is actually the Green Revolution, which is the third agricultural revolution, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, you should already have the first agricultural revolution and the second agricultural revolution and the results of both of these in your notes. If you do not, make sure that you go back and you revisit these slides anywhere from pages uh, slides 14 all the way through slide number 21. Again, paying attention to the primary and secondary effects, crop hearths, okay, that type of thing. All right, so when we talk about subsistence versus commercial, and some of this is a review for you, uh, subsistence farming is, again, it's the production of food primarily for consumption. It's for survival of your family. Um, sometimes they will actually barter or trade it for other resources that they need, but for the most part, it is actually for consumption on the farm. It's practiced in developing countries, so typically LDCs, or if we're talking about periphery or semi-periphery countries. Additionally, it has a higher percentage of uh, farmers in the labor force, roughly 40%, uh, 44% or so. Uh, it has a lack of technology and mechanization, and additionally, there's a smaller size farm because, again, you're only farming for yourself and because you're not using large equipment. Commercial farming is the production of food primarily for sale off of the farm. It's not for your own consumption. This is primarily in MDCs with large plots of land, a large amount of machinery, pretty expensive to participate in this as well, which also means that there's a lower percentage of farmers in the labor force uh, because of needing a huge amount of land and additionally machines doing a lot of the work instead of people. Uh, the result of people shifting from subsistence to commercial farming is, of course, the enclosure movement, urbanization, uh, and people moving into other sectors of the economy. So when we talk about the percentage of labor and uh, force engaged in agriculture, if you look at the areas that are uh, sort of heavily shaded on this map, the percentage of labor force engaged in agriculture is very, very high in areas we would call sort of the developing world. And again, these are people who are participating in subsistence agriculture. It is that have very low percentages, for example, the United States and Canada has just under 2% of percent of the population engaged in agriculture. Um, that is again, because of large machines <clears throat> and commercial agriculture. Farmland, just as you would suspect, okay, the amount of machines is gonna be seen uh, much larger in MDCs, whereas LDCs typically are gonna be lacking and therefore they rely on human labor. When we talk about LDCs versus MDCs, as I mentioned, the big <clears throat> discrepancy between the two is whether it is for production on the farm and consumption on the farm or for consumption off the farm, which would be commercial. Typically, LDCs are shifting cultivation, intensive subsistence wet rice, intensive subsistence non-wet rice, and pastoral nomadism. Plantation farming also occurs in LDCs. However, I want to point out that this is an exception to the LDC subsistence rule. Uh, they are actually commercial uh, production, usually owned by MDCs. MDCs are going to use mixed crop and livestock, dairying, grain, ranching, Mediterranean agriculture, and commercial market gardening or truck farming. I'm going to go through these quickly. Uh, I also wanted to mention to you slide number 28 through 31 are several questions that would be really good for you to try before Friday's test. Um, these are questions that you can find the answers to in your book and in your notes, um, but they're really big ideas that I would highly, highly, highly encourage you to visit um, and kind of take this as a hint for the test. All right, so quickly, if we're looking at this map, we're actually looking at subsistence agriculture types. You'll see the blue area is nomadic herding. These are sparsely populated areas, also sometimes called pastoral nomads, uh, where they're going to travel across large spans of land in order to graze their animals across pasture. Again, this is not necessarily land that they own, but they consider it their own territory. 
If you look at shifting cultivation, you'll find that it's primarily in tropical rainforest. And then sedentary intensive agriculture is a fancy way of saying rice farming. Um, these are people who are staying put and they're probably uh, participating in rice farming or non-wet rice dominant uh, smallholder crop and livestock farming. So let's start with shifting cultivation. Shifting cultivation, like I said, is usually in tropical rainforest. You don't need to write down this whole doggone slide because hopefully you already have it on your graphic organizer. Uh, the idea is you actually start with a small area of land. Um, once it's cleared, the vegetation is burned and um, we call this slash and burn agriculture. Slash and burn agriculture is gonna provide a lot of nutrients from the ash. Uh, people will actually farm in that land. We actually call that swidden. Swidden is land that has been cleared and is ready to farm. At that point, the soil remains fertile for about two to three years. Usually the second year is the most productive. After two to three years, they're gonna allow that piece of land to fallow, which means you are going to allow it to just lie idly, allow um, natural regrowth to take place and you're not gonna worry about it. While you're doing that, you're not going to be able to plant that piece of land, which means you are going to then clear and slash and burn another area of forest. You're only using a very small amount of land at a time, but yet you are allowing a huge amount of land to fallow, usually in anywhere from 16 to 24 years of fallow before you actually return to it. You use slash and burn agriculture again, um, and you revisit that Swidden, uh, and it's this really cool cycle. There's really no lasting damage that occurs, making it a very sustainable practice, and the only unfortunate aspect is it does use a lot of land. So when we look at this from a perspective, from a visual perspective, this is actually what it looks like. You have here a um, slashed area of rainforest, which then is actually undergoing uh, slash and burn agriculture that results in swidden. That's that land that's cleared and ready for cultivation. This is a really good example of a piece of land that has actually been cleared, slash and burned, Swidden has been planted in, and you can see that multiple crops are going to be growing here. Again, you don't want to monocrop. Monocrop means specializing in only one uh, because your entire community is reliant on this one field to provide everything for an entire year. Uh, this actually shows in the distance, you can see an area that has not yet been slash and burned. You can see an area that's currently in cultivation, and you can also see the area that has been uh, used for fallow. So probably two or three years past when it was um, used. And then, of course, harvesting is done by hand, super labor intensive. Um, so you have a high percentage of people participating. Intensive subsistence is a little bit diff uh, different. Shifting cultivation takes up an awful lot of land. Um, they still have to intensively farm just the one piece of land that they're using. Best examples of intensive subsistence is wet rice and non-wet rice dominant intensive subsistence. Intensive subsistence means um, a super efficient use of a small parcel of land in order to maximize the crop yield. You need as much food as possible from a tiny piece of land in order to support your population. This is usually characteristic of areas with high agricultural density, which if you remember is the number of farmers per arable land. Um, and this is again the largest percentage of people in the world participate in intensive subsistence wet rice. So they will do everything that they can to get every little morsel of rice out of the land. And additionally, they will even flatten the landscape in order to create terraces, which would increase the amount of land that they then have to farm. One thing that they will try to use is something called intertillage. Intertillage is mixing different seeds and seedlings in the same swing. You're actually growing this at the exact same time, so it's not exactly the same thing as double cropping. Um, this is actually harvesting throughout the year. It's going to spread production over the entire season. Additionally, this will benefit you if some sort of fungus or disease or um, pest comes in and kills out one of your crops. If you just monocrop uh, that crop, you would be devastated. Um, so instead, this is going to offer a lot of diversity in case of disease and pests. And additionally, this the major, major, major reason for intertillage would to be to help control the soil erosion and nutrient depletion. A lot of these uh, plants are actually nutrient providers, while some Plants are actually nutrient takers, and so therefore you would plant both in the same swidden in order to um, capitalize on nutrients being replenished. And additionally, the root systems are going to hold the soil in um, place so that nutrients will not run off. Wet rice dominant is, uh, like I said, the most practiced a, um, type of farming in the world. Uh, it is an intensive subsistence type of farming found mostly in South and Southeast Asia, um, East Asia as well. It's super labor intensive, uh, so a large percentage of the people are going to be participating in the workforce. Um, you have to actually transfer the uh, rice seedling from the nursery into flooded fields. 
again, takes a lot of time. The actual harvesting of the um, patties is a big deal as well. Uh, it is the most important source of food in Asia. And additionally, uh, it is, like I said, practiced by the largest percentage of people uh, in the world. Uh, they will also participate in double cropping, if at all possible, especially in warm winter areas of South China and Taiwan, where they can actually get two crops in one field per year. Uh, if we're looking at rice production, you can see East Asia, uh, East Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and then there are a couple areas of the world that also participate in rice farming, including the United States. Non-white rice dominant, these are areas that are, again, people farming for subsistence. Uh, however, they do not have the climate that is conducive to wet rice. So they're typically a little bit colder. They have less rainfall. They have harsher winters. They don't have the monsoon seasons. Uh, they're going to provide for a flooded paddy. Therefore, they are going to farm intensively a very, very, very small amount of land. We call this intensive smallholder livestock and um, crop. It usually uh, will use crop rotation as well as intertillage in order to make the most of their land. And oftentimes will incorporate livestock into the area as well. Pastoral nomads. Uh, pastoral nomadism uh, is um, sort of a shift between hunting and gathering and livestock ranching. So it's similar to livestock ranching, except again, uh, this is not for commercial purposes. They also are not going to consume uh, or eat their animals. Their animals are actually bred for uh, milk. And they also will use blood for nutrients, um, clothing, even shelter, keeping them warm, uh, using their hides, trading and bartering for other things. Some of them will obtain grain from sedentary subsistence farmers in the area. Sometimes they'll actually tend to crops in an area while the men of the tribe will actually go out and graze the animals. Um, from pasture to pasture. And again, the reason you're constantly grazing is the land in these areas is not very good at all, which means you're constantly moving your animals in order to find food for them, in order to survive. You can't overgraze an area, otherwise uh, there won't be anything left. So you're constantly on the move. Uh, they use something called transhumance. Transhumance is movement of herds according to seasonal rhythms. So during the winter, you might move to the lowlands where it's a lot warmer and grass is growing aptly. At the same time, you actually will move to the highlands during the summer because it gets too warm in the lowlands. This is called transhumance. Usually pastoral nomads will follow the same route year in and year out. They kind of consider it their territory and they get very territorial about it, even though a lot of times they don't actually own the land. It's found in really dry and sort of semi-arid. Okay, arid means dry areas of North Africa the Middle East and South uh, Central Asia. Um, they herd usually camels, goats, sheep, and cattle. And like I said, many of them are actually being pressured into living a more sedentary life uh, because of governments wanting the land, wanting them to stop uh, this moving across uh, international boundaries and things like that, uh, and land actually being turned into agricultural or mining um, land. All right. The exception to the LDC rule is plantation farming. Large mono, uh, mono cropping, um, large scale mono cropping means uh, usually pretty large areas of land. Mono cropping means, of course, just specializing one, and it's going to be a cash crop, something that typically is not going to be grown in MDCs, um, but that is going to be in high demand. Good examples of this is cotton, sugarcane, coffee, rubber, cocoa, uh, bananas, tea, coconuts, palm oil, and the list can go on and on. Uh, typically, this is, again, found in tropical rainforests or tropical lowlands, um, islands a lot of times. Uh, typically, these are semi-periphery, but for the most part, these are really peripheral countries that are going to be used for labor. Um, not a whole lot of machines are, are going to be used on plantations, and instead, human labor will be used. Um, the hope is that they are being compensated fairly, but unfortunately... A lot of times that we find uh, that they are not necessarily making a ton of money off of um, a resource that their country has. And usually MDC countries and MDC um, corporations usually own these plantation farms and profit. Uh, there are some fair trade established uh, plantations, and that's becoming um, a more popular thing as consumers start to care about where their food's coming from, the ethical treatment of animals, uh, ethical treatment of uh, humans doing the labor. We'll talk more about that in Chapter 10. All right, so I'm going to pause there, and the next video will be about commercial agriculture. So I would encourage you to continue following along and take notes uh, over this, as we will not be going over it in class.